Hey buddy, watch this. Hello, hello, Regis Kilbin is the name and Hearthstone is the game, and this is part seven of my Mean Streets of Gadgets and Card Review. This time around, it's all legendaries. I've got four new legendaries to talk about. So let's go ahead and jump right into these cards, starting off with the new Hunter class legendary. This is Knuckles. Uh, he is a gorilla with some brass knuckles or thorium knuckles or some sort of knuckles. Uh, he's a five mana, three seven beast, and his effect is after this attacks a minion, it also hits the enemy hero. So essentially this is the kind of minion that allows you to double down on all of your damage. So at a base, he's doing three damage to minions. You kill something with three health, and you're going to ping the enemy hero for three as well. So clearly hunters do like to do damage. Their hero power supports that play style. Uh, so this is another way to just chip off your opponent's health and allow you to end the game via the consistent damage of your hero power eventually. Um, there are a decent number of stats bundled into this minion. 3-7 uh, is a unusual stat allocation. We don't see that a lot. But it's a total of, of 10 stats and, you know, a 5 mana 5-5 five, five is not perfectly vanilla. You'd expect a 5 mana 5-6, but there are a lot of playable 5-5 five, five cards in the 5-6 to six mana range. So the stats here don't look out of place at all. They're, they're more than reasonable enough. And if you're playing sort of a more mid-range to late-game Hunter deck that would be willing to run a 5-drop like this, then playing this on 5 with 3 attack is probably going to enable it to trade into some of the early-game minions that your opponent has played, killing those nasty Tunnel Trogs and so on and so forth. So... Uh, the real risk, I think, with this card is that it is a tad slow. Uh, just because, you know, it doesn't have taunt, it doesn't do anything instantly, and its effect actually probably doesn't even pay off all that quickly. It's an effect that might not pay off until the very end of the game, five, ten turns later when you actually find lethal. So you're investing quite a bit of value that this card proposes m into a much later payoff, way down the road. So you could run more active cards on turn 5 that have taunt or clear a minion or do something specific instantly to help you swing the board in the mid game, whereas this one's a little slower. Uh, if you do play it in the late game, of course, it still does have uh, some value potential, but the problem then becomes that 3 attack really doesn't trade all that well in the late game. But the one thing about this card that I haven't talked about yet is Grimy Goons Synergy. So Grimy Goons, of course, are the new theme of card that buffs minions in your hand. So if you run this in a Grimy Goons deck, there's a very good chance this comes out as a 4-8, a 5-9, a 6-10. And when you start to look at those stat lines, this gets really, really scary. Uh, even as a 5-9, let's just say that, right? A 5-mana 5-9, five five first off, great stats for its cost. Clearly, you've paid a little bit of a penalty with Grimy Goons cards on the way to that becoming a 5-9. But if you're trading into 5 health stuff and also doing 5 damage to the enemy hero, that's going to add up really, really quickly. So a minion like this might only actually get to attack once, unfortunately, which means a total of 5 damage. So it's kind of like bundling in something like a kill command. Um, but the problem still, even if this gets buffed, is that it's only when it attacks a minion, not when it deals damage. So when this counter attacks, it doesn't actually use the effect at all. So you kind of have to play it out there for a turn and let your opponent deal with it and give them time to deal with it. And if they are able to handle it, if they've got like the perfect fireball ping or the polymorph or some kind of efficient removal answer, then it's not going to do anything. The effect is useless, right? It never got to attack. So you kind of wasted... Um, the potential for this card to be really good. Of course, if it eats a polymorph, that's a pretty positive trade. But there are many other ways your opponents can trade into it with minions. Uh, many other ways for them to kill it. So there's a chance it's just a complete dud. So a lot of cards have instant effects that wouldn't be a dud. So ultimately, I, I just said a ton of different stuff. And some of it's good. Some of it's bad. In the end, I think this is probably not really that awesome of a card. Just because of its pacing issues, it takes a long time for it to pay off. And you give your opponent all the time in the world to deal with it before you actually get to rack up value with the effect anyway. So between it taking a long time to get that value and the risk that you never get any value at all, 
I think this card might just be too high of a price to pay, even in a Grime Magoon deck. So Knuckles is probably an average card, just because there's nothing wrong with it. But not anything above that, in my opinion, which might be surprising for some people to hear. I'm not really sure what the community uh, sentiment is on this card, but that's, that's my take on it. So let's go ahead and move on to the next one. It is another Legendary, but this time it's one of the Tri-Class card Legendaries. Of course, this is the Grimy Goons Crime Family. This Legendary will be available to Paladins, Warriors, and Hunters, the three Grimy Goons classes. This is Don Honcho. He is a 7 mana, 5, 6. And he has the battle card, give a random minion in your hand, plus 5, plus 5. So this is kind of the super Grimy Goons buff card. Most of them just give plus 1, plus 1. <laughs> this one amps it up and basically gives you a blessing of kings that goes back into your hand. So uh, obviously that's pretty strong. Any minion that gets a 5, 5 buff is going to be good when you play it. Uh, that's almost regardless of what kind of minion it is. Uh, it's going to be a threat, right? So if it hits the right kind of minions, it's going to be like a super insane, crazy threat. I'll let you figure out all the kinds of cool synergies this can enable. Uh, something like Leroy Jenkins comes to mind right away, right? You could have a huge charging minion that does tons of damage, combining it with stuff like Blessed Champion from Paladin to do even more burst damage. Uh, but there's a bajillion other combinations, and you really can't miss... When it comes to a buff like this, uh, it's going to be good. But really, Don Honcho, to me, has the same problem that a lot of Grimy Goons cards have had. And that's that it's just kind of slow. You know, for a 7-mana card, a 5-6 is not particularly exciting. That's worse than a basic Boulder Fist Ogre. Uh, this battle cry is going to hit a random thing in your hand. By turn 7, there's a good chance you'll be able to play that the following turn. But you still have to wait a turn to play it. So it does take time, and when you play it... It still has to wait a turn to attack, so it gives your opponent time to answer it. So uh, it's it's a random effect, so you never get to pick what you want unless you have a very, very specifically designed deck. It's a slow effect, and you're paying a slight penalty in stats, too. So uh, Don Honcho certainly fits the theme of Grimy Goons, but unlike cards like Doppelgangster that can be a really big swing card um, quicker, I'm not sure that this one does, although, of course, this works really well with Doppelgangster if you're able to hit this buff on Doppelgangster. So uh, it's certainly playable. It's not bad by any means, but much like Knuckles, I, I think it's really more average than above average. I, I don't think I'd go so far as to call it good, uh, but but a fine, neat design, a little bland, I guess, maybe, or basic, uh, but really just takes the Grimy Goons thing to an extreme, which is, which is cool, really, at a fundamental level. So... Uh, Don Hancho, Don Hancho is um, an average card, believe it or not. And up next is Madame Goya, a 6 mana, 4, 3 minion with a battle cry. Choose a friendly minion and swap it with a minion in your deck. So this is a battle cry, and basically if, if you have a minion on the board, any minion in the world, you're going to be able to play Madame Goya, pick some minion on the board, that minion's going to go back into your deck, and she's going to pull out a Tyrion Forging, or a Ragnaros, or a Yasharaj, or <laughs> something ridiculous. Now, the, the minion that's pulled out of your deck will be random, uh, but much like Barnes can do crazy stuff when it pulls a minion out of your deck, I think Madame Goya is going to be able to do crazy stuff when she pulls a minion out of your deck, and it has the benefit of the fact that it won't be a 1-1 one, one version of the minion. It will be the full minion. So you'll get like the full 8-8 Ragnaros. Now, honestly, um, that that's obviously an upside. But there are some downsides. It's not a copy of a minion. So uh, you are actually like thinning out your deck a little bit and, you know, using that resource. So unlike Barnes, which can kind of give you two Ragnaroses or two Sylvanases or two Yasharajas or whatever it might be. Uh, Madame Goy is only going to give you the one. It's It seems to be an actual swap effect, not a summon effect. So that's a slight downside. Clearly the stats probably outweigh that to some extent. Um, the other downside with Madame Goya is that she has the same amount of stats as Barnes, but she costs significantly more mana. So whereas Barnes can sometimes be played on turn four and just making a stupidly big swing where it pulls out the Tyrion 
or the rag or the cairn or, you know, there's a bajillion different things you've seen Barnes pull out and win games on turn four. Uh, by turn six, there's a slightly higher chance that your opponent has some means to deal with whatever is pulled out, even if it does have bigger stats and a bigger body. So uh, I, I don't really know that this is better in faster, more mid-range decks. And I actually don't know that it's better in control decks anyway, because there's a good chance that your opponent is going to have an answer for whatever you pull out at some point anyway. So you kind of just you know move through your deck faster. You put yourself in a worse spot in long games for fatigue. You expose yourself to um, uh, overloading the board and, and essentially giving them a, a more efficient flame strike or a more efficient clear or you know, twisting nether or whatever it might be. So if you overextend with Madame Goya, that's bad. Uh, so a lot of people are saying this card's like really, really insanely good. And, you know, it's Barnes 2.0. Um, I think that that's an oversimplification of her. She's not as good as Barnes. And uh, she's still good, don't get me wrong. This is a playable card. But uh, not, not as good as Barnes and not nearly as destructive as Barnes. And not as unfun for opponents as Barnes. Uh, one thing I didn't mention, though, with this card, there could potentially be some value to swapping a minion out. For instance, say you've got, like, an Ancient of War that was a 510, but your opponent did, like, 8 damage to it. You know, you can put it back into your deck and, and draw it again and, and reutilize that health. It'll be a full health 510 again. Um, cards with Battle Cry effects, if, you, you, if it's all Battle Cry and you play it, and you get your battle cry, and you want to take it back out and put it in your deck for another instance of that battle cry. Madame Goya can do that. So uh, that part of the card is almost to me more interesting in a way than um, the the summoning part of it. So comparisons to Barnes certainly make sense, uh, but I, I don't know that that's really where this card will shine. I think we'll see some battle cry shenanigans, perhaps more than anything else, with Madame Goya. In particular, I could see some crazy stuff happening in rogue decks with uh, uh, copying minions and, and putting stuff in your deck and there's all kinds of shenanigans that can happen there with battle cries so who knows what madame goya will enable in that world uh, so, so definitely a playable card but i'm not freaking out about this one as much as everybody else i think she's within reason i think she's balanced but a nice creative design that will certainly see play which is probably where most cards should live so i, I think this is a well-designed one so finally, moving on to the last legendary in this review. It is the new mage class-specific legendary, Ink Master Solia. Solia. Ink Master Solia. Seven mana minion. It is a 5-5, five five and a battle cry if your deck has no duplicates. So right there's the Reno Jackson uh, slash Kazakis effect. Yeah, the next spell you cast this turn costs zero mana. So you play Ink Master Solia, seven mana, five, five, and you get to cast a uh, Flame Strike for free. So you get to spend 14 mana on turn seven. Clearly, that scenario's pretty good. Even if you play Ink Master Solia and you get to cast a Fireball, that's pretty good. But a lot of people. But despite the fact that a lot of people are thinking this card's kind of overpowered and stupid good, I'm not sure she's that amazing. Um, sure, there's going to be those turns where you ink Master Solia and you flame strike a board on turn 7 and that enables you to win the game. But there's going to be other turns where this is sitting in your hand and you have like arcane missiles. Or, you know, just like a secret. And again, that's not bad at all. But is that really any better than... Uh, say, uh, Firelands Portal, a 7-mana card that does, like, 5 damage and summons you, on average, something close to a 5-5. Five five. Doesn't that feel kind of similar to this card in many ways? It's like you spend 7 mana, you cast a Fireball, and you get a 5-5. Five five. That's what Firelands Portal feels like to me much of the time, is I get a Fireball <laughs> and I summon a 5-5. Five five. Clearly, there's some false equivalencies there, but... Ultimately, it's not all that different. I'd say 80% of the time, this card isn't more unbalanced than, than anything else. Um, there's also the new Warlock card. I haven't reviewed it yet, and I'm blanking on its name. Uh, but it's a 7-mana 6-6 six, six that does 3 damage to every minion on the board. So it's basically a 6-6 six, six and Hellfire combined into a single card for 7-mana. 
this card is not even better than that one, right? So Ink Master plus the Flame Strike is a very similar effect to that new Warlock card, <clears throat> but you have to use your Flame Strike, so you have to actually use a card. Same thing with Fireball. You have to actually use the Fireball, whereas Firelands Portal kind of merges those into a single card. So, yes, this is certainly playable. This is kind of a theme. This is going to fit fine in Reno-style decks. There are going to be uses for this. It's a nice tempo advantage to get a free cast off. But I actually don't think it's totally ridiculously overpowered like some people. And in fact, having to utilize that card sometimes in control matchups that run really late, particularly in Reno-style mages, utilizing two cards to do one thing is very problematic because a lot of times tempo isn't as important as value in Reno-style decks. So uh, this might be at odds with itself just a little bit when you could run other cards that accomplish similar kinds of things. Uh, if this was actually like, you know, a 4-mana 3-3... Well, that would probably be overpowered. If this was like a 5-mana 3-3 three, three that had the same effect, instant inclusion, awesome card. Because it would come earlier in the mana curve, and you'd be able to make that spell count for more earlier in the game. A tempo advantage, you know. Say you got that flame strike off on turn 5, obviously that would be a huge swing. When it comes to turn 7, it just I, I don't know that it can do that many overpowered things. Because frankly... Um, depositing that extra 5-5 five, five on the body, uh, extra 5-5 five, five body on the board isn't really all that big of a deal on turn 7. Sometimes you could just cast the Flame Strike and probably be okay. So, again, good card, but I'm just not that excited about it. I think people are going to be a little bit disappointed in uh, the execution of this card. So, uh, we'll, we'll see, I guess. We'll, we'll certainly see. I hope I'm wrong because I like cards to be good and to be fun. So, I'm going to give this card a shot, clearly, uh, but don't be surprised if it doesn't live up to your expectations. So, ultimately, in the end, all four of these cards felt r <laughs> rather similar in that um, I think they're all moderately well designed. I think they're all quality cards, but I don't see any of them making that big of an impact on the meta. I don't think there's any super game-changing cards here. I think there's just playable cards that will fit into new styles of decks. Uh, but that don't, you know, don't give you nightmares or don't do anything so crazy that they change the face of Hearthstone on themselves. And, and ultimately, that's fine. That's that's a good card design if it if it works and it's playable, but it doesn't feel super overpowered. So uh, good on Blizzard. These are all going to be fun to see in action. So that's going to do it for me and part seven of my Mean Streets of Gadgets and review, of course. I'm sure you've got some thoughts on these cards yourself, and I would certainly love to hear them. So leave a comment below with your take on all four of these legendaries. Did I miss any cool synergies? What decks are you looking forward to playing them in? And uh, did I just get it all wrong, or did I get it right? Are these good? Are they bad? Or something in between? Thanks so much for watching, and until next time, game on.